Welcome back to the core. We are now in our section called Human Relations in World Missions. We have done an introduction to this course. Now you know where it came from. And we have already made together an introductory prayer. Take that burden. You need to be the one to say, here am I, send me. This is what God does. God does not come to us and command us. He comes and entices us. He draws us in, especially in this day. Since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God allows forceful or violent behavior. And the forceful people are raiding that kingdom, taking positions, taking the spoils of eternity by asking God to give them a vision, by asking God to give us a ministry. We need to have the force to go. We need to make every effort to enter into this position in this place. There is a call in your life, but that's how you ended up where you are now. That's how you are with me because God wants you to know these truths. And so as we start off in this course, we look back at the book, Human Relations in World Missions, and we read an introduction, the relationship between the missionary and the world that surrounds him must be deeply understood and appreciated by the missions candidate before he or she ever ventures forward to a foreign country. Many would-be missionaries fail due to a lack of preparation and return to their sending nations crushed and discouraged. The, the majority of these never return to the foreign field to fulfill the call of God on their lives. And you think, well, why then would they be crushed and, and discouraged? How did this happen? Well, it's due to their lack of preparation. You say, what preparation? Well, the preparation is simple. Only through much tribulation can any of this be done. Only through much tribulation can we enter the kingdom. Certainly only through much tribulation, persecution, difficulties, and trials will we ever be able to do anything for Christ. It's just the way it is. I wish I could tell you, yeah, if you obey God and do what he's called you to do, there'll be no challenges, no issues. But then I would be a liar and I would be selling you a bill of goods that is false. Jesus didn't say it to his disciples. It was not said to the Old Testament patriarchs either. He said, I will be with you. He always says, I'll be with you. Recently, we've been studying Jeremiah. He told Jeremiah that I am with you. Jeremiah said, I'm too young and I've never done anything like this before. He, he was worried about his ignorance and his inexperience. And God said, don't say I'm too young. So be quiet. It is not about you. It is about me, the Lord says. It is my strength. I'm calling you. A lot of missionaries don't realize this, and they go out there having been promoted and lifted up and told that they're awesome, and everybody applauds them, and they go out with a warrior mentality. Or maybe they've made a couple of missions trips, and out there in the missions field, they filled cups with Kool-Aid and gave out some tacos or sandwiches to poor kids that were shoeless in a village, and they did that for about a week of sweaty labor. And they just feel so good about it. They go back from their missions experience and get on their knees and they cry and they thank God. Oh, what a great experience I had. I just have never realized how blessed my life is. I've never realized all that I've been given. Believe me, I've done a lot of missions trips. I've hosted a lot of missions groups that are coming to the mission field. And it's so funny when young people come, teenagers now uh, the age of millennial and beyond that we see these, these generations that are rising before in the times that I predominantly served as a missions visitors guide in the ministries in northern Mexico, I met a lot of these teens and we had them involved in all the projects we do in the villages, in the slums, and they work for, you know, we had them going 15, 16 hours a day and every meal was a lecture about missions and they were so hyped and so excited and at the end of the week exhausted and they went back and the parents would write us and tell us, thank God for whatever you did to my child, he's just so grateful and he's so thankful for his home and his his own private bed and the air conditioning and the food we have and all these things. And that's a good response to a mission trip. But I've found basically there's two categories of people that go on these mission trips. There's people who go and come back and thank God that they don't have to do that all the time. And they, they're so thrilled. But there are those people who go and then when they come back, they feel absent, they feel missing, they feel something is gone from their life, and they cannot stop that feeling until they return to the mission field. Those are the people God is drawing to do that work of service. 
obeying that call, responding to it and doing what the Lord said to do. It's not easy for by any means, but not everybody feels it right away. And there are people who are not prepared. And if they go not prepared and they're thinking that missions life equals a missions trip, then they will be gravely disappointed because something happens after 21 days. When you pass your third week, 21 days, you know it takes to create a habit. Well, that's when reality comes. 21 days is when you realize, like, like Judy Garland in, um, in when she's singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, that she is no longer in Kansas anymore. You get that revelation of the fact, like on The Wizard of Oz, that, that wait, this is a whole different universe. It's a whole different place. And, that is often challenging. A lot of people quit. A lot of missionaries quit early on because they realize they just can't handle it. They thought they were able to. But I like to be able to lay a foundation in a time of preparation that can cause individuals to count the cost and be ready for it. And that's why I like to do this course because of this fact that because of this, they return from the sending nations crushed. And I'm going to give you very detailed reasons why and what are the main factors that cause missionaries to fail. So the series will be divided into five sections placed in the chronological order in which the missionary will encounter them in an average missions experience. Now, this is an important note. To define a mission, quote unquote, we must understand that everything a missionary does is to accomplish the end result of multiplying the local expressions of the universal church of the Lord Jesus Christ. For this reason, this series is based on the church planting adventure. And that's why we will see each step of this adventure in order from conception to completion focusing in on the relationships between the missionary and those involved in his life. In other words, the environments that surround him or her. You've already heard my teachings on women. You know that women are equally called to do these works and that apostles even, there are female apostles in the Bible. So woman, you're out there, you're thinking, I don't know, I'm just a woman. Well, shame on you. Don't say I'm just a woman. Don't say I'm just a handmaid and I'm but a virgin and I can't be used to, to carry the, the purpose of God or that I'm, I'm just poor and I can't do that. Be more like Deborah. Just be willing to do what God's called you to do like all of us. So to define this mission, we know mission is ministry. And there's no difference between mission and any other ministry. So really, missionaries are simply apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and also the ministry of helps in support of those speaking ministries. That's what we have to understand. And so how does one develop into these positions? How does one grow from the time they receive Christ until they are fully functioning missionaries or fully functioning ministers that are reproducing themselves to such an extent that they've planted churches and they have many disciples? Well, these sections are the chronological following of that adventure, as I call it. The missionary and his God. Number two, the missionary in the sending church. Number three, the missionary in the body of Christ. Number four, the missionary in the world. Number five, the missionary in the planted church. Let me just say it like this. It could be the minister and his God, the minister and the sending church, the minister in the body, the minister in the world, and the minister and the planted church. It all works the same way. And I'm going to talk about every facet and area of this. So, I realize that this series is designed specifically to cater to the needs of the future missionary. However, it also will be useful to those pastors, leaders, and church members that will support said missionaries in their missions career. If we replace the word missionary with the word minister, as I already have, this series would be useful in any ministerial endeavor, wherever it may take place. And I'll tell you something interesting too. While I was in India, I was invited and I've been invited to different parts of India. Primarily, I did a lot of work in Mumbai in connection with the, the ministries there and with Myra Fernandez and all those others. But I've also done work in um, uh, Wisakapatnam. I did some conferences there through the years and all those areas. When I'm invited to teach pastors and ministers about church planting, I take this exact course and I put it into my word processing program and I do a select, you know, find 
and replace function. And I type in missionary and replace it with minister and press enter. Ta-da! It's a perfect course on ministry in general about church planting specifically. So that, that's what I mean. And I've done that in India and it's been very successful because often people do not believe that a third worlder or someone in these poorer cultures can be a missionary because a missionary means they leave that country. No, it does not mean you leave your country. You can be a missionary to your neighbor. You can be a missionary. And the reason I say this is because the, the very term missionary is not even a biblical term. Yeah, not a biblical term. I challenge you, go right now, look in a concordance, look up the word missionary in the Bible. Do a search, missionary in the Word of God, you're not going to find it because it's not there. We see ministers, we see apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, deacons, bishops, overseers, you know, all these realms of functionality in the body of Christ. But a missionary just seems to be a tag that man puts on the ones that leave their culture. But when you look at the work of Jesus, they all were leaving their cultures all the time. All of the apostles ended up going to different regions and teaching in different cities and places, so they were all missionaries. And so was the other patriarch, as we've already seen. So am I, so are you. In fact, they're very, very, the minority, the rare individual is the one God does not expect to leave their father's house and their father's country and their father's relatives and go to a land flowing with milk and honey. We're all called to a promised land. We're all called to go out and I will continue to hammer that into you that you not excuse yourself from this beautiful process of becoming everything that God wants you to be. So the minister is a missionary. Missionary is a minister. Human relations in world gospel work. You could just as easily say, and that maybe I'll retitle it Human Relations in World Gospel Work. I don't know. But now that we're going through this, we're going to start with the very first module as we look now in the book, which is The Missionary and His God. And the first thing that I write here is Saved for the Nations, the purpose of salvation. I want to ask you a question very seriously. Why do we stay here on earth after receiving Jesus as our Savior? Now really, it sounds like a silly question, but it's a good question and I want to ask you. Why? Why after we receive Jesus as our Savior, do we stay in this cesspool? I mean, this is a sinful place. There is nothing good about earth. It is corrupt. It is evil. And there's the world, yes, but the love of the world is, is not going to help you. If you love the world, you don't love God. And so our love for God means that this place is rejected. We're called out of this world. We are called to separate, call out of darkness into His marvelous light. So the love of the world is not in us any longer if the love of God is in us. If you have the love of the world, then you, the love of God will be missing. I don't love this world. I don't want to stay in this world. I'd rather just go home. And the thought of going to heaven is one of the most exciting things I could ever imagine or dream. So I'm always ready to depart. I'm ready to go whenever he wants me to go. Not everybody shares this, I understand. I think it might be part of the fact that I've had experiences to show me heaven, and I've had several visions of heaven, deep, detailed, visionary states where I've seen what awaits us there. And believe me, it is completely accurate when it says, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor has it entered in the hearts of men what God has prepared. But I, like Paul, I have been caught up to realms in spirit. I have seen things that are there. Maybe before all this course is over, I can share those stories with you. I cannot teach them as doctrines, of course, because they're personal revelations that I had. But they are quite amazing. And when, in fact, it is a great deal of the strength that I live by and my focus and a great deal of my passion and love for there and not here. It's built upon the revelations that he's given me. Of course, all of them are consistent with the Word of God, but they go way beyond the Bible's descriptions of the realms of God and the eternities. And so I'll, I'll share them with you eventually. I'll just tease you with it now that, wow, the things I've seen. And so this world, why is he leaving me here? Why did God abandon me on earth and leave me down here? Wouldn't it have been a lot more merciful to simply take me home and not leave me suffer? Because there is nothing but suffering down here. And so, why does he do this? Why can we not, as evangelists, simply carry a pistol around with us? And every individual, we would be doing them a great favor if every individual who prays to receive Jesus 
uh, that moment right at the end of the sinner's prayer while their eyes are still closed and they say, Amen, I receive Jesus. Thank you for it. And the little tears are rolling down their eyes. You just sneak the pistol out and pow, blow their brains out, kill them. You would be doing them a favor. They, they, they're securely saved. Their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They don't have to go through any suffering or hardship. They immediately to be absent with, from the bodies, to be present with God. Ding, do them a favor. Wow, wouldn't that be great? Of course, we don't do that, nor should that be done. But why? Why not? What if the rapture occurred as soon as anyone received Jesus? Well, obviously, people would stop receiving Jesus. If there was a phrase or a belief that confessed meant you vanished before man, people would not be going around making that. It would be outlawed. It'd be prohibited. And so, God does not do this because what? Because He has a purpose for our life. He has a function for us. So why are we even saved? We're not saved for ourselves. And this is the thing that I keep coming back to. We're saved for the nations. We're not saved for our own benefit. We're not saved simply because God loves us so much and we're so special and we're so delightful. No, in fact, God will never speak to you about you without it being connected to someone else. Moses, you will deliver my people. Gideon, you will fight for my people. Jonah, you will go to the Ninevites. On and on and all the call on throughout all time is always about everyone else. So save for the nations, the purpose of salvation. Why? Well, it's because God has a purpose for our life. And if it were not so, he would be cruel to leave us in this sinful place. So his purpose is that we be messengers of the truth of his son that we discover at the point of salvation. It is our responsibility to deliver the invitations to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The question is, where will we do it? So each one of the disciples of the Lord Jesus is called to evangelize, of course, but some have been equipped with a specialized call to go to nations, right? And this is where I start to get into part of the sovereignty of God in this regard. And I have found it interesting that people that I've known through the years, and I've raised up a lot of missionaries, and I've trained, I have inspired well over a thousand missionaries. And these are people that actually say the reason that they do what they do for Christ, the reason that they're in service, the reason that they're preaching and teaching is because they heard me preach. Seriously, I'm not exaggerating. So at least, at least a thousand. I'm sure it's above that. I don't have an exact number. I'm not taking a census. But I do know from many conferences, many places in many nations where I have taught and I go back five, ten years later and people come up and these are pastors in conferences and they just, they're so excited. I just wanted to thank you. And I'm like, for what? Well, when you shared, I don't know if you remember back in whatever, whatever, and I almost never remember, of course, because it's not my work, it's God's. And they say, but man, when you preach, the Spirit of God came upon me. I remember feeling the fire burning my heart and I went home and I couldn't sleep for this many days, blah, blah, blah. And this is often, one of the things I get very often from people is, you ruined me. Everything was fine until you came along. I was happy in the bliss of my ignorance, but you came and you preached what you preach and you talked about missions, you talked about a call, you talked about obeying God and I just couldn't get away from it. I had no more excuses and it burned in, do, in me until I gave in and God called me. Now I've been in ministry for this many years and they go on of course to talk about the hardships of it. We have paid great price, we have suffered, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. And the good thing is when they receive a call like that from God, maybe I was a tool to be used, but when they receive that call from God, they can't put it on my back. I didn't send them. God sent them. I just was used by God to light a fire. And that's what the Lord told me many years ago. Stephen, you are a fire starter and you will start many fires and they will become blazes. Although you only impart a spark at times, those people will burn brightly for me in all the nations of the world. That's a word I received when I was very young, very young at the age of 17 or 18, an 
uh, a prophet laid hands on me. Jim Johnson was his name. And he said, you will prophesy to inanimate objects. You will speak to properties. You will call them into service to God. And those properties and those buildings will have to obey. You will speak to individuals and your words will be the mandate of God to them. And they will burn in them. And they will become ministers. And I'll never forget this prophecy that I received. In fact, it wasn't just that one. And it happens. Because I believe these principles, I teach these principles. Why are we here on earth? No other purpose but to reach the nations, to reach the lost, save for the nations, the purpose of salvation. And each one of the disciples of Jesus is called to do this. They're set apart. Now, besides the thousand or so that I have inspired, there I have trained personally through the core way over a hundred that I actually impacted and prepared and gave these teachings to, and then they now have functioned or are functioning out there as missionaries. And you say, are they all still out there? No, they're not all still out there. Because the sad fact of missions work is it is not something people continue to do forever sometimes. And statistically speaking, now this is just statistics gathered loosely from multi-denominational environments and missions agencies from all different groups. And it is a common statistic, and it still holds to this day, that the average lifespan of a missionary is five years. And that if you can make it past five years, you are a veteran missionary. You say, why is that? Because often they simply cannot handle it. They do it for as long as they can, but when it cannot be done any longer, they quit, they go home. Uh, God's grace is great, His mercy is great, but they stop serving on the field. Why? Well, there's different reasons why. Sometimes it was the aforementioned problem of not being properly prepared. They didn't realize how hard it would be, how difficult it is. And we're going to talk about the need to count the cost as we move along here, but when God calls us, we respond. And not everyone feels that. And I know quickly, I'm glad that the missionary that inspired me, what David Hogan, when I heard him preach, gave me the opportunity and said, whoa, brother, wait a minute, we need to talk to your pastor. Because obviously someone as exciting as David Hogan had inspired at that point when he inspired me. Maybe thousands and thousands and thousands of missionaries. Like if I were 1% of David Hogan, it would be amazing. I would, I would be very successful, but I, 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 am, I can't even hold the candle to David Hogan. I almost want to call him Sir David Hogan, like he has been knighted in the kingdom of God. And if you ever met him, you'll know what I'm talking about. Amazing man of God. Probably one of the greatest men of God I've ever met in my life. Up there with Danny Ost and you know Lester Summerall when I met him and these individuals, David Hogan, all these men laid hands on me and prayed for me. All these men imparted things to me for the kingdom of God. And David Hogan is one. David Hogan, when he laid hands on me, he did it with force. And he even prophesied to me, I'm going to share that prophecy with you in the future. But when I told my friend who worked for him in Freedom Ministries that he prophesied to me, he says, actually not common that he prophesies to people. But he prophesied to me and I carry, I carry that word in my heart constantly. And I've gotten to meet him again and again through the years. What a wonderful blessing he is. But that inspiration that came, each of the disciples... They're called to evangelize. We all have this job, but sometimes it is bringing us into other realms. And as for the ones that end up not serving or end up not being a missionary, it does not mean that they do not have a purpose and a function. As long as I understand that their purpose is still for the souls to be saved, even if they're in their own country and their own people, they also can do the work there. And one thing for sure is at least their missions experience has served to validate them as a minister, to put them to a series of trials and tests. Just because you fail a trial, just because you quit from a task, it does not mean it did not have a vast benefit in your life. But one thing I always take issue with and contention about is when people do churches and then leave them and abandon them and don't support them. Now, I... Don't believe that you have to support them for the rest of your life, but they need to be able to stand independently on their own for you to move along. And I do not believe in a super long-lasting government. I let 
ministries become, what ministries want to become, because there's so many more to do and make and connect to. But some of these missionaries, they because the church doesn't grow big enough, fast enough, they decide that, well, it's just a failure. So they have this work, right, with a dozen or so people gathered together, but because it's not 50 people after three or four years of their life spent on it, they decide that those 12 people are just not enough. And so they do one of a few things. The worst thing they can do, and I have seen this done many times, is they simply abandon them and leave and say, God bless you. Uh, the next thing they may do is just put them into another church. At least that's responsible. Connect them with another ministry. And not all of us are supposed to be forever in someone's life. But gosh, I would never want to have to face God if I have been given babies in Christ and I left those babies by themselves to be consumed by wolves, I must take care of the newborn believers. And so I will stick it out. For me, missions experience, seven years is has been the minimum for me or that I stay connected to churches that I said, or seven is the ideal. You can do it in less. Paul, of course, did it as little as two years, a year and a half or so, but he always had people left in his place who were capable and called of God. We'll get to that later when we come to that. But we're called to do these things. We need to make sure we obey what the Lord is speaking to us. Now, I want to go to a passage of Scripture in Galatians chapter 1. And I write here 15 through 16 where it's talking about the Apostle Paul being prepared from before the creation of to be a messenger to the nations. But as we go there, I want to go all the way back to verse 13 in this case. It says, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Now we know this is true, that this is Saul of Tarsus, who was commissioned by the Sanhedrin as an agent, a kind of like a detective or a policeman, to weed out the dissident, members of this sect or cult called The Way, and those were in Jerusalem corrupting the truths of Judaism, according to the Sanhedrin. Remember, the Sanhedrin was the religious law system in place at the time, and they hated Jesus and did everything they can as a religious group to take Jesus down, and finally they found an inroad through the weak link of Judas Iscariot and paid him off and were able to betray he betrayed Jesus even to death, and so therefore Jesus was able to pay the price that God intended him to pay as the Lamb of God once and for all. But we also see that kind of betrayal continue on from there. But Paul was someone who was part of that system that even paid the guards to lie and say that the body of Christ was stolen from the tomb so they could try to nullify the power of the resurrection. There's always been in place, but here Paul was an evil person. That's what he's referring to in this passage as he's telling the church of the Galatians, my previous way of life in Judaism as a Jew, as a member zealous for the house of God in Israel, he made it his his mission to destroy the believers and did so even to the point of death. He was there at stonings and that's where we see him when Stephen was stoned. It was at the feet of Saul of Tarsus that the garments of the people were placed for him to be a custodian as oversight. He was an oversight to that stoning. He says in verse 14, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. There's another passage where he says concerning his relationship with Israel, he said a Pharisee. He says as concerning the law, he said without flaw. In other words, he kept spotlessly the entire law of Moses and his education under Gamaliel and the great teachers of the day were, was to the caliber of Pharisee. He memorized the Pentateuch. He, he could speak verbatim Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and also knew all the historical books very well and could recite them. And the prophets he knew inside and out, upside and down. And so his knowledge base was amazing. But when God, he said in verse 15, who set me apart from my mother's womb. Now, this is a reference to Jeremiah, and he's referring to the 
first chapter of Jeremiah in the first verses where it talks about Jeremiah's call. God who set me apart. Remember it says in Jeremiah there that, that God told Jeremiah, I knew you. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart, he told Jeremiah. And he says that he, I have appointed you. Before time began, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations to build up and to tear down, to establish and to, to bring the word of God to those nations. So this is the reference Paul is doing. Paul often quotes Old Testament passages in pieces just like Jesus did. In fact, Jesus only spoke Old Testament passages all the time. Jesus was a walking Bible. Imagine if you could only talk to people by cut and paste of scriptures. Jesus pretty much did that. He spoke in scripture constantly. Remember in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word was made manifest here. We saw him. Well, the Word, God's Word was Jesus, and Jesus was the Word, constantly speaking. Well, Paul similar. He knew the Word very well. When God who set me apart, like Jeremiah, from my mother's womb, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his Son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. So here we see very clearly what Paul is, is speaking about this call on his life concerning missions, the purpose of salvation. Why does God leave us here? Because he has a purpose for it, and we will know this purpose often beforehand. The Apostle Paul was prepared from before the creation to be a messenger to the nations. God calls men and women with a special call that leads them out away from their homelands into the foreign regions of the earth. A true missionary usually knows this within the first days of his salvation experience. And here we will see that the word of, what the Word of God says about this destiny. Now this is really interesting because I have noticed this to be true. Many believers in the beginning of their experience when they first meet Jesus, they first really starting to pray and seek God, have visions. And you would be surprised at how many of them had visions of the faces of souls in foreign lands. Very often, very common. My experience with this was when I was about 19, I was 18 or 19, and as I was really seeking God for His purpose in my life, I believed I was going to be a missionary from what I was hearing. It was the consensus of opinion from those around me. But I was still being convinced and still wanting to hear directly from God Himself. And I was in a room where I had an amazing encounter with God after just a couple of years of knowing Christ. And in that room there were maps, National Geographic maps, covered all the walls in my office. And there was a day when the Spirit of the Lord came to me with great power and He brought me into eternity. And when He did, I looked at those maps and I saw superimposed upon the maps, depending on the nation I was looking at, I saw faces. It was many faces looking up with tears in their eyes. Some of these people were brown. Some of them were darker brown than others. They all looked different than me. I did not see many faces that were not as if they were African and Asian and other ethnicities of these different groups around the world. It's like whatever map I looked at, I saw the harvest of precious souls that God wanted to save. This was so impacting to me when I saw that. Now, I thought I was the only one and I was special. It turned out later on in talking with more believers in different places around the world that they too saw these visions. They saw the faces and they felt that compulsion. Instinctually, many believers feel this. You may, may be out there and say, well, I've never felt that before. Okay, but I'm really addressing people who have seen that and who have felt it because maybe you have, but you've never done much with it. But I believe many are called Fewer chosen when it comes to missions. We're saved for the nations, saved with a purpose. Paul knew this. He knew that he was set apart to go as a missionary to the nations. He had this instinct in him, but it had to find itself 
later on as time went by. And there's a passage of Scripture I would like to show you as we go on in Acts. We're going to read verses uh, chapter 9. I want us to go through Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and onward. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And this is what we were talking about a moment ago. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. Some people read it with this intonation. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but not, did not see anyone, it said. So these men were there with Paul, they heard the sound. What sound was it that they heard? We don't know, but something. And there's a little more light shed on this later when Paul recounts this story because this was Paul's story. Paul retells this story three times in the book of Acts where it says, I was on the road to Damascus. There are people there that heard, in different times he speaks about it, it changes a little bit, but it's always exactly the same. Just a little more revelation is given, a few more details. Verse 8, Saul got up from the ground, but when he had opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus, because now he's blind. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. This is that moment I like to say it's as if God caught up with him and punished him, spanked him, put him in a room and said, now you sit here and think about what you've done. And imagine what was going through Saul of Tarsus's mind during these three days that he met Jesus. How much remorse do you suppose was flowing through the heart, mind, and soul of Paul for three days? Certainly accepting that he probably would be better left blind forever, but now he's blind and did not eat or drink. So he's fasting, and he's thinking, and thinking, and fasting. During this time, in verse 10, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man in, named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. They told me about this guy. This is a guy who's going around killing people who believe what we believe. And you want me to go talk to him? He's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Isn't it interesting that Jesus can come to you and talk to you directly when you're praying and you might not like what he has to say. This is so true in so many realms. Don't think that when Jesus comes to talk to you, he's going to tell you what you want to hear. It's always a job. Not about Ananias. I'm sure this is the greatest revelation and the greatest moment that Ananias has ever had with God, at least that we know about in the Bible for sure. By the way, this is not the Ananias that lied about the property. This is a different one. But this Ananias on this day is having an amazing encounter in a conversation with Jesus himself. And the first thing he tells him is, I'm sending you to this maniacal murderer of believers in me, please. And he knows who this is. And so, of course, it's not something he wants to do. He says, they call, they arrest the ones. This guy is, is, has authority from the highest courts of the priests of this land to arrest anybody that calls on you, Jesus. But 
the Lord said to Ananias, go, and this is the way it works. Sometimes the Lord just says, go, and you don't have a choice. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now we talk about the call of God. When God speaks to us, the details of the call upon the Apostle Paul are already outlined here before Paul ever even hears it. Ananias is told while Paul is still stewing in the repentance mode in that room for three days without eating or drinking, blind. I'm sure he's praying. He was a godly man. But now I'm betting he's talking a lot to Jesus. And Jesus wants to talk to him. We don't know that he hears a lot in these days. Some people conjecture that maybe during those three days he was caught up to the third heaven. Maybe this is the reference he makes. Some conjecture that perhaps he was caught up to the third heaven on the road when the light came and hid him. Whatever the case, it could have happened then. It could have happened in the room during the three days. It could have happened after that. He could have had more visions and more revelations, as he calls them. But whatever the case, we know that during those three days, he was developing or evolving in his repentance. And now Ananias is being sent. So very clearly, though, we see this call on him and where he is called. Looking at verse 15 in, in the plan of God, it's obvious he calls Paul his, what, chosen instrument. God chose him like a carpenter chooses his tools according to the specific job at hand. Are you the right tool for the job? I'm asking you now as the students. And we're going to see many things in this series that will help you decide. God called me to the foreign fields from very early. How do you know that? Well, there were some issues, some things that were supernaturally revealed to me from the time I was very, very young. I've shared a little bit, but in light of this context of the fact that the purpose of salvation is that we're saved for the nations, he leaves us here so that we can go to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When I was only about eight or nine years old, when visiting my father's boss's home during a barbecue they had there, I went to go use the upstairs toilet. And there in their hallway, as a young man, I looked at this massive poster on the wall. And the poster was an advert for a, a bullfight. You know those bullfighting posters with the matador? in the beautiful pose with the bull and the spears and all that. It was one of those big pictures and it had words written on it, of course, from Spain about where the bullfight was taking place, but I did not know the words, although I could read at that point in my life. And this disturbed me and I was perplexed and I stared at it and I kind of went into this weird trance, just staring at that poster at those words, did not understand because I only spoke English, and those words were written in Spanish. Well, the owner of the house, the wife, came, and going up the stairs, she's the one that had sent me upstairs to use the upstairs toilet, because the other was occupied. When the toilet become unoccupied, she came and said, what happened to that boy that I sent upstairs? So she come looking for me and found me there on the staircase, staring at the poster. She said, hey, honey, what are you looking at? And I said, I'm looking at this poster. She said, yes, when we lived in Spain, because they were, you know, they worked with grain elevator and export import of grains and other pulses, and they were they served there for all. When we worked in Spain, we bought this poster because we thought it was pretty, so we use it as a decoration in our house. And I said, it's the words. I don't know the words. I can't read them. And she said, Oh, honey, it's because it's a different language. She said that's Spanish. And when she said that's Spanish, I felt this feeling cover my whole body and the hair on the back of my neck stood up like a frightened cat and I tingled all over and something in me came into me and knew that I had a connection to this thing called Spanish. Why would I know that at the age of eight? You know that principle that I talked about in eternity and the transcending of eternity and time, deja vu, predilections, premonitions, all these things, not necessarily prophecy, but I believe that eternity is in the hearts of all men. We do have a, a transceiver 
In other words, something that can send and receive signals in a spiritual dimension, in an eternal dimension. Part of that information is about our own future. And God can open our eyes with words of knowledge. That's what he did that day. And I was not even a believer yet. What he basically was giving me was the gift of the word of knowledge given to an unsaved child at such a young age to start a process in him as a chosen instrument to go to those lands. Whereby I did eventually go, and I'll share a lot with you about it, but I did learn that language, although the, the year I was going, the very, the, the, I only knew two words going to Mexico as a missionary, and that was taco and burrito. Oh, three, hola also, which is hello. I knew nothing. I went completely with no knowledge, but less than a year after that, I was fluent in the language. And by the second year, I was already teaching grammar to the new missionaries and did so for a couple of years and taught over 60 missionaries in that time that I was instructing those new missionaries coming in. I mastered that language. If you were to test me on the Spanish language and my knowledge of it, I would say that it is pretty much absolute, certainly beyond my knowledge of English, absolutely beyond my knowledge of English. There's nothing I do not know about the grammatical structure and form of that language. I mastered it so well that the Mexican Bible school students would submit their essays to me and their outlines for me to check their grammar. <laughs> That's funny. Three years in eighth grade, dropped out in ninth, a missionary in Mexico. That can only be done if there's a supernatural purpose. And that purpose was revealed to me when I was just eight years of age, a boy looking at that poster in that house. This is something that was in me before ever the time began. Paul quoted that passage from Jeremiah that I formed you, I knew you. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. This is, this is in conjunction with the other scripture that says that, that he has, before the foundations, he's predestined us to a purpose, before the foundation of the earth. There is an eternal plan that is connected to missions. And I believe that his purpose for almost everyone to connect in some way in this capacity, and if not exactly that, it's some connection you have, our eternal purpose must be found out. And Paul knew this. And I knew it already. I fast forward a little bit and maybe a couple of years after that, I was in school and there at that time, the Vietnamese or American war, it's funny that we call it the Viet Vietnamese war in America, but in, in Vietnam, they call it the American war. It all depends on who you're fighting, right? So during that war, a lot of refugees were, were um, separated from the Khmer Rouge and or the um the the not the Khmer Rouge I'm sorry the um partly yes the Vietnamese communists and because we were there as non-communists we gave refuge to those that were fleeing and thousands went to the United States all over so much so that the third most spoken language in multiple states in the United States of America is Vietnamese and <coughs> which is really fascinating second most commonly spoken language is Spanish First is English in America, second is Spanish, and depending on the regions, the third is either German, Vietnamese, <coughs> excuse me, or some other places, other languages. But I was in my homeroom, in my homeroom class, and the first, this is, and you have to understand, we were kind of isolated where I was. We only had Cajun white people, very few African Americans also at the time where I lived. We had a neighborhood across the highway, across Highway 90, called Kennedy Heights, where the black people lived. But m me as a white person, we lived on our side of the track, so to speak, and there were very few. I remember the first time an African American moved on our block, and wow, at the, at the block meetings, at the crawfish boils or the seafood boils, we heard so much about it, and our parents ranting in their prejudices. But at that time, the only thing worse than an African-American would be an Asian or some, they had dirty words they used for them, I won't even repeat what they called them because a lot of these guys were actually in the, the Vietnam War and they, a lot of their friends were killed by the Vietnamese soldiers and whatever the case, 
when we took these refugees in from that part, there was a lot of issues and a lot of prejudice against us. The Ku Klux Klan and these other groups fought it and they burnt out their shrimping vessels and they burnt down their homes and they threatened their lives. It was really sad. These poor people were just looking for another chance, like all Americans have at one time. Long story short, though, I was in the room and here comes this girl. And I'd never seen anything like it. She was so beautiful. That girl, what is she? I've never seen her like. And it was a gorgeous girl. And the girl was Vietnamese. And her name was Thuy, which means flower. And I fell in love and just could not stop staring at her. I just, that same thing I felt on the staircase, my hair stood up. I felt this tingling all over my body and I knew somehow I had something to do with that person or those people that are that person. How do you figure that out when you're only, only 10, 11 years of age, 12 years of age? You, you cannot possibly comprehend these things. But it was instinct, it was inside of me, it was part of my design from before time began. And I know that a lot of people feel this. I know that a lot of believers go through these feelings. They've seen the visions of the faces. And I want to help those people find the fulfillment of that call so that we can all do what God's called us to do in the realm of missions. But with that, I'm going to take a break right here, and then after the break, we'll come back.